All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is uh, Joel Berrocal. Uh, I'm the National Director of Small Business Development with the National Puerto Rican Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to welcome you all to another NPR Chamber work, uh, you know, educational workshop. Well, this is a big priority for us, things we want, we want to keep doing. Um, so uh, today's um, webinar will be uh, titled How to Build a Website, and I'll introduce our host in a minute. Um, but first, um, I just want to let you know, um, if you're not, uh, you know, following the, the the NPR chamber, I ask you know you check out our website, uh, check out our calendar. We have a lot more workshops and stuff like this coming up. A lot of great things coming on the benefit small business in, in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. Uh, so I'll I'll drop our website in the um, in the chat, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So um, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our host and let him let him uh, take it from here. So. Uh, I'll, so David Binkowski is a, a good friend of the chamber. He's, he's presented for us in the past. Um, so he's so this is essentially not exactly a part two, but it's kind of a deeper dive into what he had presented last time. So if you haven't seen, if you didn't see his pre presentation before, um, all our, our, our old presentations and webinars are available for uh, small business members. We have an entire archive library full of these type of um, educational workshops and stuff like that. Um, so, David, I will let you um, go ahead and introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background, and then the, the show is yours. We'll, take, we'll let you take it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me again. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm David Binkowski. I'm the president at Large Media. I'm going to share my screen just to get right going, going right into the presentation here. Uh, we're going to talk today about how to build a website and not my kids painting rocks. Um, so let's present there. So we're going to talk about how to build a website today. And uh, I am David Binkowski and the president at Large Media. I started building sites many years ago. Uh, and I still, to this day, build, design, update, and optimize websites for clients of all sizes, whether the Fortune 500s, mid-sized businesses, small businesses, or startups. Um, I was also a highly rated former adjunct professor at a couple of different colleges. And I absolutely love teaching. So I hope that comes through in this presentation. I hope you learned something today. We're gonna save questions for the very end. There's a lot of content. So I'm gonna to try to get through all that content and then we'll take the questions. Uh, I do live in my house with my wife as well as two of our sons and our two bulldogs. So if you hear snoring during the presentation, it's not me falling asleep, it is the dogs. Um, as was mentioned, there's, there's a presentation in the archives about why your business needs a website. So please go check that one out. Uh, some of the content I'm not going to go over again there's a little overlap, but not much. Uh, so I wanna get into the actual uh, doing of building a website. So we have a, a very quick agenda here. We're gonna talk about website strategy. We're gonna go through a website creation checklist. And again, this presentation will be available afterwards if you wanna screenshot it, or if you wanna just wait till it's posted, either way, you'll get that checklist. We're gonna talk about website architecture and why it's important, as well as writing content for the web. Now, when you write something in an email, or you write something for, let's say a memo, or you're writing a presentation. Those are very different styles of how you would write. Writing for the web is very different from all of those. So we're gonna talk about what that is and how to do it properly. We're gonna talk about color and design principles as well. Again, you may not be a designer, but it's good to have an understanding of what works and what doesn't. And so we'll go through some basics on there. We're gonna look at what you see is what you get editors or WYSIWYG editors. And we're gonna talk about coding. And people talk to me and say, why do I need to learn how to code? And I've been saying this from day one since I started teaching people how to make websites. In fact, the first websites that I made through a community college, they were asking me to use front page to teach students to use that. And back in the day, Microsoft tried to create their own proprietary version of the web using their own code. Internet, Internet Explorer created many, many headaches for people like myself trying to build websites because they wanted you to use Microsoft products. And fortunately they did not win out. Uh, standards won out, coding standards won out. But what I told my students and what I'm telling you now is I don't need you to be a master coder. I don't need you to learn HTML front and back. But much like when you buy a car, it's nice to know how to change your own oil. So we're gonna go into some of the basics of coding there. At the end, I'm gonna take you into a demo. The demo will not take very long because I want you to see how easy and fast it is to get up and running with building a website. But much like this presentation, before you get there, you need to have a solid foundation as to why you're building it and all the assets and things you'll need to actually create the site. And again, at the end, I'll save room for questions. So I have a question for you. Is your website marketing 
or is your website sales? Most people would say, I think it's marketing and they would be wrong. The reason that you have a website is that it is a sales tool. So keep that in mind always. It must work with marketing, but your website's purpose is to sell. Now, depending on your business and what you're looking to sell, you could have a website that is a portfolio in which you post your photos, your graphic design work, any artwork that you've done, et cetera. And that would be one type of website. This is the stuff I do, hire me because here's my great work. You may have a blog where you're creating a media channel of some kind. So you're creating podcasts, you're doing videos, you have blog posts, you're you know, creating a travel website where you're blogging about the places you've been, et cetera. So that's another type of website. And that would be creating entries based around your experiences. You could have an e-commerce website, which is pretty self-explanatory, but if you're selling your stuff, you have an e-commerce website. And that includes things like digital downloads. So if you are selling music, if you are selling an e-book, that would classify as an e-commerce website. Let's say you're just making a resume website. Well, that has a purpose too, right? So it has all these types of websites have a purpose. And there's a strategy around why you would have a website for each one of these. Now, most websites that they're built today, there are templates that go along with these and many of them have, have been optimized around these specific things. I'm gonna build an event-based website. So I'm gonna throw a fake conference and I'm gonna build a website right in front of your eyes. So if you are doing an event, let's say you're throwing a concert or you're having a festival or you have the opening night for your business or whatever it might be, you can build a website specific to that. And then finally, if you're running a nonprofit, there's a purpose to having those websites, whether it's looking for fundraising and donations, information for the community or to build community, et cetera. So when you think about the type of website you want, you need to define that first. What am I looking to do? I'm looking to sell, right? We just defined it. It's not just marketing. I'm looking to sell. Now, what is it that I'm selling? And these are some categories that you can then put yourself into. When you create a website, as I talked about last time, you have to define why you're doing it and then what are your goals? And the goals are important because as you put time, effort, money, energy, hiring, whatever resources you put into this, you wanna make sure you're getting that back in the long run. So you should have goals as attributed to that. So it's not enough to say, I'm gonna run Google ads to drive people to my website. I would ask you, why? What are you looking to have them do? What's the amount you're looking to spend? And what would be, what's the ROI of someone who actually converts? Meaning they saw your ad, they clicked on your ad, they landed on your website. Did they click the contact us button? Did they add something to the cart, right? Those are all actions that you can then measure to say, I spent hundred dollars in ads. I had two people buy products and I made $300 on those. Therefore ROI calculations can be done around the spend versus the profit, right? So you need to find your goals going into it. You need to define who your target audience is. You need to define who your site are. You need to define your site's architecture, meaning how are people going to find stuff on the site. You have to develop a content uh, content for the site as well as a strategy for getting your content out there. So we'll talk through that as well. You then, once you have your your goals, audience, architecture, and content, you need to pick a platform. There are, are a lot of them out there. We'll walk through some. And in the end, I've picked one that will create a website with using. I also want to talk to you about designing and branding 101. Again, I don't expect you to be a designer, but having basic design and branding principles and concepts in mind while you're developing these things will help you come to a, 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 come to a better place faster. We're going to talk about coding, as I mentioned earlier. We'll talk about testing and then getting you to launch. So these are the steps you're going to follow. Now, as I mentioned previously, you have to set up goals for your site. So in this instance, the sprinter wants to run faster. There are very specific things that he's going to do, whether it's in the weight room or on the track to make himself faster. So you are gonna do the same thing. You're gonna set your goals so that your website has a purpose and that everything you do ladders up to these things. So one of those goals might be, I wanna increase sales in my website. Makes sense. If you are looking to do thought leadership, let's say you have a book, and you want to write a blog post and continue to blog to show your thought leadership. Now your goal is I want to become an authority and we can track what that means as well through traffic to the website, shares of your posts, comments and engagement with your posts, et cetera. You may have an issue with your, your business 
where you want to improve your customer relationships. So let's say that you have some service that you're offering and there are a lot of questions that are being unanswered online. Your website can be a great place for people to find that information and to get the answer they need. And in many cases, when you take care of your customer, they will take your content and they'll share it for you. So it, it kind of works uh, on both ends of the equation. You're helping new people and your existing customers can also help those new people too. It happens all the time in social media, but if there's no repository for that content or information, then people don't know where to get that information to help solve the problem. And, and the last one I put is to build your brand. So again, getting your name out there, becoming well-known, et cetera. So as we look at metrics, we're looking at our clicks, how many people are coming, coming to the website. We're looking at the conversion rate. So and when they, once they get to the website, are they actually downloading something, buying something, signing up for something, et cetera. And then your sales. So are your sales hopefully going positive from there? When we look at, again, becoming an authority, the metrics we're going to measure as far as whether we are an authority or not is our number of clicks that we're getting to our website every month. Are we getting social shares and are people linking back to us? So if we're writing blog posts, for example, are people finding that content? Are they finding it useful? And are, are they sharing it back to their networks? And it may come in the case, whether they post it on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever. It may be that they write their own blog posts and include your content in there and link to you as a result of that. I read this great blog post over here, i.e. your website, and here's my take or here's something to add to it. Those backlinks are also very helpful as it relates to search engine optimization. That's a whole other track that we'll, we'll get into. Uh, but search engine optimization requires people sharing your content, getting backlinks, and actually being the content being relevant. So they all play together in that, from that standpoint. Improving customer relationships. As I mentioned, as people are looking at your website and they're looking for ways to get questions answered, they're going to engage with your content. So as they spend time on your website, as they read through your content, are those numbers going up? And again, those are things you can all track. And the last is building your brand. And these are kind of soft numbers and a soft thing. Building your brand means gaining more impressions and getting social sharing. So who's your target audience? And like this baby looking at themselves in the mirror, it's not you most of the time. And this is the fatal flaw and the fundamental mistake that many business owners make. As they say, I'm selling to me because I like the stuff I sell. You are not selling to you. You are selling to a very defined person or persons. They have an age range typically. They live in certain places. They like certain brands, right? So it is in, some, in many cases, not you. And in the last presentation I gave, I talked about Honda. And Honda created a car back in the 2000s called the Element. It was this boxy car that had a rubber interior. And, if you, and the, the commercials for that car were people surfing. It was young people, surfboards, like this is your on the go tent and you can put your boards on top. That was the entire basis of their advertising was young people, young people, young people. Well, as it related to who bought it, it was baby boomers because they found it to be extraordinarily versatile and easy to get in and out of. The doors were nice and wide. So Honda developed a product for someone that didn't want the product and instead had to pivot to who they marketed this product toward. I've worked on campaigns personally and have had clients personally that I've had to re-educate them as to what we're doing as it relates to marketing. Again, you are typically not your audience. When you think about your audience, you need to step back from them and you need to define who they are so that you can be accurate when you're targeting them. Again, looking at their information, looking at their everything you can know about them on the left-hand side here. So do they have a job title that you're targeting if you're doing B2B? Do they have an income level that you're targeting if you're selling a product that's, let's say, more expensive? Do, do they live in certain markets? Are they in the New York metro area? Are they in the Des Moines, Iowa metro area? Those are two very different areas. So understanding where they live is important. Or are you targeting someone who lives in San Juan versus someone who lives in Umacao versus someone who lives in Mayaguez? Very different audiences, very different markets. So you have to understand who your market is and who you're targeting. You have to understand what's their education level. So when you write for the web and you're writing content for them, they can actually understand it. 
knowing their online habits are extraordinarily helpful. And one of the great things about data and about the internet, it's also the scary part, but the good part about it is that as a marketer and a business owner, Google, Facebook, all these platforms will tell you what these people's online habits are. So you don't have to do a ton of homework on this one. It'll show you the information right there. You want to understand what their preferences are. So again, what do they like to do? What sites do they like to visit, et cetera? You want to know what like brands there are. And I, I kind of touched on this already, but if someone likes, think about your, your brand and what it stands for, your product or your service, and think of other things they may like. So they may own an iPhone and they may like BMW and they may like filet mignon. So you start to all of a sudden put together, what are the things that they like that are, much, that are, that are akin to my brand and how we're positioned? That's an easy way to market. If you already like this, you've seen this with the Amazon did this brilliantly in a digital way. Customers who bought this also bought this. So they're upselling you right there. Uh, keywords and search are another way to help to find your audience. So how are they finding you? How are they searching for you? And this data is all available to you, by the way. And then last but not least, our macro and even micro trends. So a macro trend would be, we're in the middle of a pandemic and people can't go to the gym. Well, what happened during that time? Gym sales and home gym equipment could not be kept on the shelves and created massive supply chain issues. That's a macro trend. Supply chain issues, People aren't going out, they're doing stuff in their house again. All these home improvement stores, all the appliance stores, they made a killing during this pandemic because they helped, you know, that was just how it was. People were at home, they want to work on their house, right? So the more you understand these things, the closer you can come to defining who your target audience is and understanding who they are. Now, how do you get that data? Well, the first is Google Analytics. If you have a website currently, and you don't have Google Analytics running, I suggest that you put that on there as soon as possible. Most websites, whether it's a Squarespace, Wix, front end, WYSIWYG type of website, or a WordPress type of a website, have plugins and have packages for you to put that on there without knowing how to code. The second is to do surveys. And it seems a little old school and corny, but it's, it works. What you're doing is asking your existing customers, what do you want to see from us? How do you feel about these certain things? What do you want to read? So we're producing the type of content on our website that they want to see. The third way of finding out more about your target audience is through Facebook and LinkedIn data. You can go into these ad platforms and pretend you're creating a campaign. Pretend. You can go in and literally set up an entire campaign. And before you hit publish, you can back out of it. And during that process, you can play with all the variables that are in their database. Facebook in particular, Again, it's scary as a consumer, it's very scary. But as a marketer, it's a gold mine because I can understand my, how many people are in each target audience or each target market that I'm going after, what they like, how old they are, and what it's gonna to cost to target them. I can go into any of these ad platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and provided I know what I'm looking for, what input to put in there, I can get the output that I'm looking for. So again, you can understand your audience without spending a dime by just using the data that's already preset in these platforms. Some are better than others. Facebook, number one. Google, right up there. LinkedIn, not so much. Twitter, eh, I wouldn't put too much stock in it. So depending, depending on what you're looking to do. But Facebook has the data. That's why they're such a scary company. And the last is market trends and research. So just by Googling, you see their associations, there are research companies that put out free data and free information all the time. And in some cases you can subscribe for a low cost and get more data based on your target audience or what you're looking for. So understanding market trends and research will also help you understand this. Now, one, one of the shifts that's happened in the last several years, but even more so today, is that Google is placing a premium on making sure your website works in mobile. They wanna make sure that your site shows up on these phones. So when you look at running campaigns and you're looking at your analytics, keep in mind how fast your site loads matters. Google cares about that stuff. And you need to look at your analytics because that will tell you a lot about how they're accessing your website, how customers get to your site. If customers get to your website and 90% of them are on mobile and your fonts are this big, not only is Google going to ding you for that because you can't read it, but they're gonna leave your site within two seconds. 
So again, understanding what's out there, doing some research before you get started is a great thing. When you do this, once you start to understand these different things, and again, Google breaks these out for you, you can start to look at creating audience personas. So this is Susie and she is a college student and she goes to a division one school in a major market and she has an income of $25,000 a year. You can get that data from Google. So this stuff is all available to you. And what you start to understand then is to put people into segments. So politics, marketing, data in general needs to be segmented so that you can target. So what we're doing here is using all available data to then create audience personas or segments. This is a look at Google Analytics. And this is a one week snapshot of 70, 69 users that came to a website and what they did. Now, I don't care about the right side as much. What I'm looking at, what I want you to look at is the left side. Look at the audience breakdown that Google provides to you. They tell you who's on the website right now. They tell you the lifetime value of your customers. So if you are in business currently and you know that if you get a sign up to your insurance business, let's say, that's worth $6,000 a year in profit to you, right? So you know that the lifetime value of a client annually is $6,000. They're with you for an average of 10 years. That's $60,000 per person that registers to your website. You can input that information into Google Analytics so that when people are taking actions on your website, you can start to see who's actually panning out as a paying customer or not and what that's worth to you. And if you're meeting your numbers, you can break it down by audience, demographics, interests. So again, I've always been, a, 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 I've always contended that the internet and one of the things that it's done is it has changed how marketers should think about targeting people. I worked on the General Motors account years ago and I, I used to hang out in these Corvette forums because that was the brand that we worked on. And we had people of all ages that hung out in the Corvette forums. There were men, there were women, there were young people, there were old people, there were middle-aged people, all different demographics, all different backgrounds. The thing they had in common, they loved the Corvette. Some of them were aspirational buyers, meaning that when I make enough money, that's the car I'm getting. Some of them were current buyers. Some of them were uh, collectors or they had older Corvettes and they wanted to see what were the changes with the new ones, et cetera. They had, that, that was an affinity. They all liked the Corvette. So if I looked at the, the data, it's going to say it's all over the place. These people are all, but when I start to segment it, now I can figure out who's a buyer down the road, who's a buyer right now, and who can we maybe talk into buying one if we do a limited edition or a collector's edition car, right? Google gives you all this information for free, quote unquote free. They also keep your information too and then turn around and sell it through ads, but that's another story. But you can get this information for free on your website as long as you're running Google Analytics. So I highly encourage you to, to get it. Now, on the right-hand side, every one of these tabs on the left will give you more data than you know what to do with. So in this instance, we're looking at the engagement on our website as denoted by the word engagement at the top. And we're looking at 69 users that created 70 sessions meaning they came to the website, they did some stuff and they left, that was a session. And then how many pages that they viewed on the website? And I can start to break it down. Okay, they were on my website. Majority of people, 64 of them out of the 69 were on my website for less than 10 seconds and they viewed one page a piece. That's not great. But what's interesting to me are the two people that looked at six pages. What did they look at? And so I can actually click through and drill down on all this data to know what content it was they're looking for. And so of the 70 people or 69 people who came to my website, if two of them were qualified and they bought from me and I made margins on that, I'm fine with that. The goal would be to increase that number and get less of the zero to 10 second people coming to the site. So again, once you look at your data, you can understand all of this. When you build a website, going back to the presentation I did previously, when you build a website, think of it like building a house, which is you must have a blueprint. And that includes creating a list of pages, which includes the taxonomy or how people would get to your site, listing off the features that you want to make sure on your website, like an email form or a sign up. And then what content do you have to have at launch and then develop in an ongoing way so that you can stick to your launch timeline, but then also make sure you're updating your website as, as time goes on. 
again, if you walked into any job site where they're building homes, they're not just winging it. And you shouldn't do the same with your site, plan this out. So here's an example of what a site map looks like. And what a site map tells me and tells a user is, where's my starting point? It's the home page, so it's at the top. What are my top three options? Oh, I've got my about us, I've got a list of my services, and then I've got blog posts. Because those are the three things I determined by looking at competitors' website, looking at best in class websites, they all have these things. So I'll put them on my site too. And that's a great way that that's how the internet works, by the way. You don't have to do some weekend off in the mountains with flip charts and whiteboards trying to solve a problem that's already been solved by everybody else online. Copying works online, unfortunately or fortunately. Once they land on the about page, what kind of content will they see there? What other sub navigation items am I gonna include in there? In this case, the team, learn more about my team, or I wanna contact you. Now that I know about you, I'd like to contact you. And so I, I know that a contact page is gonna require a form so they can fill it out. Probably a phone number too, maybe even an email address. However, I'll warn you, anytime you post your email address publicly online, there are bots that scrape websites and will spam you. So if you're going to put your website online, or your, sorry, your email address online, make sure you do it in a way that doesn't give it away. So info, the, the letters at at largemedia.dot.com, that's not gonna get scraped. But info at largemedia.com will get scraped. So be smart about it. Same thing goes for services. You may have more than two services. This is just one example, but if you have a couple services, list off what they are. Talk about them, tell people what they are. What are they gonna get? What can they expect? And what makes it for you as a business better for them? So you can help them through the experience yourself by telling them, hey, you're gonna hire us for this, this, and this. These are the things you bring to the table, right? And finally, a blog. A blog. And again, blog posts are meant to create content. Content is created for the web. The web is created for people to find that content. So there's an entire lesson around SEO that, that, that will come up at some point where you'll we'll talk about how to do that. But having a blog uh, make sure that you have fresh content and Google loves fresh content. So not a bad investment. And at the bottom, I put controls on here. So let's say you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Those are three social icons. I list them on here because if you were to hand this off to somebody, they would need to know what needs to go in those spots. So you're creating placeholders for what's there. A good designer, if you're going to hire someone, Typically, a good one will not work with you unless you have final content. So keep that in mind as you're planning out a timeline and you decide to outsource something like design. If you were to do that, a good designer is going to say, I must have final content. Why? So you're not wasting their time. They want to know when they get something to work on, it is what you want it. They will deliver that thing and give it back to you. They do not want to go back and forth. No designer and no programmer wants to spend time on a phone, a Zoom, or a meeting going back and forth. Tell them what to do, give them a deadline, stick to the deadline. That works for all parties involved, and it keeps your scope from creeping and your timelines from being blown up. So always come with finished stuff. If you don't come with finished stuff, you are now on a running clock, and it will not end the way you want it to end. <laughs> it's going to take a lot longer than it should. So again, a little bit of preparation goes a long way here. So as we look at website architecture, create a simple top level navigation menu. How simple? About services, blog, simple. No one wants 15 things in the navigation. And remember when it shows up on here, it's gonna scroll and scroll and scroll and look terrible. Simple is better. So a simple top level navigation menu. Keep your URLs simple and user-friendly. When you have uh, WordPress, when you have Squarespace, Wix, whatever it is, you can determine what the URL is. So largemedia.com slash blog, done. I don't need my blog. It doesn't need to say our blog. It doesn't need to say large media blog in the URL. Just blog is fine, keep it simple. Another thing to think about is search. So as you're creating blog posts and content, same strategy. What keywords are people using to find you? 
or what is your category about, those should be in your URLs. So as you're writing content for your blog, you want to use, there are tools that are available, again, the SEO folks will, will, hey, will handle this, but there are tools available to let you know what are the keywords and the articles people are reading based on those searches. That will help you develop URLs as well and it makes them user friendly. Again, I mentioned this earlier, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Look and see what the top players in your segment are doing. Look at their websites, see how they perform. There are tons of free tools online where you can run optimization tests, speed tests, you name it, on your competitors' websites, right? So you can get all the intel you want on everyone in your category and what they're doing by taking five minutes worth of Googling and, and pasting in their URLs. And if it says their site loads slow, then try to figure out what it is that's causing that and don't do that. But if there are, are players who are out there who are having success, copy it. That's the sincerest form of flattery. Keeping your website consistent. This is more about user experience. So when they go from page to page to page, they know they're in the same place. They're not getting a different look and feel on this page, a different color over here, and a different, it, they, they don't know where they're at, right? So keep it consistent. Consistency creates good experiences. This is a, a topic we'll get into, but your website should have internal linking. Meaning if you're on your about page and you're talking about your team, you should link to the team page, right? If you have blog post topics, multiple topics, you should think about how those things should be clustered together and they link to one another. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. If you think about your content on your website and you're architecting how does someone get there, people should be able to get to almost all of your website's content within a few clicks. So don't get cute and try to have about us and then our team and then our leadership and then the CEO page and then the CEO's blog. Nobody wants to read all that. It's too hard to get to it. So re-engineer re that so that in the about us, there's the leadership right there about us. They're there. And the team can be linked off of there. And then it better be all the team's information, not another click to get more information about the team. So you wanna get people to the information they need faster. What happens if you don't, they leave. The last piece of this is to use breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs are what you see at the top of a page, usually under the logo, and it's a way for people to find their way back. So if you do deep link somebody three clicks in, four clicks in, there should be a taxonomy, a way for them to trace their way back in case they get lost. And the last thing in your, most websites that are uh, these auto builders um, will create a, a site map for you. And these site maps are specifically made so that Google can see what's in this website. Like, how do I get, um, sorry, I'm just reading the panel's thing. <laughs> how do I get to stuff on your site? Google needs to see this. And there's a whole, again, well, this will be covered in a more advanced topic, but Google has a product called Search Console where you can submit your sitemaps, et cetera. So as you start to get into things like SEO, this is very important. If you don't have a sitemap, Google will ding your website, meaning you won't rank as high as you should. So you have to make sure you have a sitemap. Many of these websites auto-generate them, these, especially the WYSIWYG editors, your Wix, your Squarespace, et cetera, they will auto-generate the sitemap for you. WordPress does not automatically generate a sitemap for you. So you have to be aware of that. And when you go to launch your site, make sure that the that it's there. So we're gonna look at content strategy. And what it is, is the, is the planning, creation, delivery, and governance of content using images and media that are used to create a positive user experience. And three examples of this would be thought leadership. So let's say I do a video for my website. That would be one instance of it. Where would I put that website? How am I going to deliver that content? All those things you'd think about. Lead generation. So as you come up with creating pages on your website that are specific questions and answers, or just answers to questions people are asking on the internet, or looking for solutions. You're looking to hire a service provider. If, if you're looking to generate leads, what are the questions and the content you need to put on that page that get them thinking and get them assured that you're the person that they should hire? And then, as I mentioned, finally, is SEO. There are apps 
there is software that's available that will write pages for you for SEO and automatically dump them on your website. I'm not suggesting you go that route, but that's what you're up against. So as you look at search engine optimization, it requires not just having a website that's clean, meaning the coding works, it loads fast, it does all those things, but that the content is useful and that people are actually getting to it quickly. So how do we start with this writing process? Well, I can definitively tell you that people don't read. And you've probably seen this no better than on social media when people post something and then there are comments afterwards that have nothing to do with what the person actually posted. And that's social. Now imagine having a corporate website where you know, copy there, you know what's there, and yet you're still getting calls to customer service asking the same damn question. That's because people don't read most of your site copy. So as you're writing for your website, not your blog, as you're writing for your website, you need to make sure that that content is clear and concise and to the point. People do love to watch videos, by the way. So as you are writing content for your website and you're trying to keep it concise, the best way and the oldest sales technique in the world is to use the words that your users are using. If I want to get you to agree with me, I'll say your words back to you. You'll agree with me. It's an old sales technique. And why does it work? Because it sounds familiar. It sounds familiar because you just said it. And it sounds ridiculous, but it works. So as people are doing things, and this is something that I've struggled with. with a, I've had clients where they say, we are this. And then they define what they are. And I say, cool, the market doesn't tell you that. So you can say that all you want. And that could be your internal thing. But that's not what, how the market talks about you. And so understanding that, again, doing keyword research, looking at your analytics will help you understand that better about how they talk about you. Doing scrapes on social media, just searching around. How do they talk about us? How do, how do consumers talk about the category? That's the easiest way to pick off a new customer because they're going to say, oh, those are, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. And then they're in. The second thing you should do is chunk your content. Chunk meaning paragraph easily readable, chunk it out. So it's not one big, long diatribe. They're not reading some you know, Unabomber manifesto about whatever your services are. They're getting right to the point, information they need, et cetera. 20% was the number I had up on the slide previously. That's how much they read. So you better front load the most important information on your page. So whatever is at the top needs to be the most important information that a consumer needs to know. I've seen news articles doing this especially in, in, in Europe, well, they will put three bullet points at the top of the article. Before you start reading, this is what it says. Because we know you're probably not going to make it to the end, right? So think of that, that mindset. This is what news publications are doing, let alone corporate websites. Using pronouns on your website is a great idea and using an active voice. Now, the U.S. government has a website called usability.gov and it has a ton of great free information if you're looking to figure out how to make your website more accessible i would strongly consider using it these are standards that when i first started making websites we were writing these standards back in the 90s because they didn't exist the u.s government has adopted these standards and, and in working with the w3c and creating their own uh, stuff have created these great toolkits and things for use for free take advantage of them this is a lot this is decades worth of research engineering, et cetera, and thinking that are, that are going into these sites. So take advantage of it. When you're writing for the, for the web, I mentioned people don't read. So keep your sentences short and your paragraphs short. If you can use bullets and numbered lists, even better. Using clear headlines and subheadlines makes things, again, chunking out content makes it easier for their eyes to follow. Using images, uh, diagrams and video are great. Bear in mind. What I mentioned about load time. If it takes forever for a video to load, then Google will automatically say, not sending people to your page. So make the video smaller, reduce the file size, et cetera. So keep that in mind. And finally, white space is your friend. Your website is not a Word document. It doesn't need to have paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph describing your stuff. Boil it down to people so they get it right away. So I mentioned the pillar and cluster model. 
and actually, if you go to HubSpot's website on this topic, they have an amazing uh, documentation that they did around their own website, where they said, we were writing all this content and producing all this content, but it wasn't actually delivering anything for us. And so this pillar and cluster model looks like this. So remember the site map that I posted earlier. In the middle of those clusters are topics. So these are the topics on my website, and these are the clusters of information that all link to that topic so people can easily bounce around and find one another. So in a topic cluster model, you can see the pillar content in the middle followed by cluster content and hyperlinks. So again, just going back to our, our, our very uh, rudimentary site map, think about replacing your blog section once you've thought it out, you know, as opposed to I had a blog and there's two posts. As you start to develop content and create categories or pillars, of these of that content, what's the content you could create just around that? It doesn't have to happen on day one. Okay. So if you're just getting looking to get a site off the ground, this is your 2.0 as you develop blog posts and things like that. But it's a very effective way, not just for consumers to find the content, but to also get love from Google, which is what's most important at the end of the day. So we've talked about architecting your website, writing for your website. We're going to talk about platforms for a few minutes here. Every uh, platform that's out there has some consistent consistencies amongst them. And when you're looking at, do I go with hosting my own website? Do I let someone else host my website, et cetera? It's just, it's a, it's a call that you have to make based on your own expertise, your own time, how much it's going to cost to maintain. Many of these uh, servers slash companies will have a guaranteed uptime meaning that their servers never go down or rarely go down or what have you. At this point in 2021, it's pretty rare they go down unless there's some wacky attack on Amazon servers or what have you. But for the most part, they have really good uptime at this point. The security of your website, so how are they making sure that people aren't hacking into your site? Are they gonna send you alerts if that starts to happen, et cetera? And then what's the flexibility? You know, are they using a content management system or a CMS like WordPress or is it a, WYSIWYG editor, like Squarespace or Wix, et cetera. So when you're, when you're looking at, again, a different hosting provider, a website host, these are the things you need to look into because ultimately it comes down to your time and your money. As I mentioned previously in the other presentation, these are the three types. You have self-hosted, meaning you're doing it yourself. That's GoDaddy, Bluehost, DreamHost, et cetera. If you have an agency, they can host it on their server too. Or if you're going third party, Shopify, Wix, Squarespace, Weebly, they host it and they worry about all the updates, the technical stuff, all that. Not a bad option if you don't have any technical expertise. We're gonna talk through web design and color principles now. Why am I doing this? I don't want your site to look bad, okay? So when you talk about the different uh, design and color principles, there are things like having balance on your page, having contrast to the things actually pop. Using color, using shapes, and using white space to create emphasis, so what's important. Having movement on your site and getting people through your website are important. Repeating things works, because again, if they don't read and they're just skimming, they see it a few times, they'll absorb it. Having the right hierarchy of, of information on your website will help with these principles as well, and then bring it all together through unity. Now, color. When people are looking at websites, whether they know it or not, the color matters to them because they invoke emotions. And there are, I put a link to getflywheel.com where you can get more information on what these colors mean. But if your website has a lot of red, that means urgency. It stresses things like crisis. If you have blue, it conveys trust. Go to your healthcare provider's website and tell them the major color outside of white on the website, probably blue. Go to your bank, probably has a lot of blue in it, right? Or if your website is sophisticated, you want it to feel more like Rent the Runway, New York City fashion sleek, you probably have a lot of black on there. So your higher end jewelry websites and fashion websites are typically black and white with some beautiful photography. There are different types of color schemes you can 
you can put in your website. I'm gonna breeze through these just because I wanna make sure we get to the demo so you can see how easy it is to make a website, but this will be in the presentation. But if you decide to stick with a one color theme, it's called monochromatic. And you can see the wheel on the right as to where that points. You can also do an analogous color scheme, which means the colors are adjacent. So again, looking at the color wheel here, these are colors that are all one degree of one another that you can use on your website and they all work. You could also do what are called complementary colors, which means they're on the opposite side of the color wheel. You could also do what are called split complementary, which means they're opposite, but they also include one or two adjacents. You could do what's called triadic. So three equally spaced, spaced colors within the color wheel can give you a nice color palette to use for your website. If you're like, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> I don't wanna do that. Here's a free website for you. There are tons of them where you can go on and you can either use a pre-existing palette based on your company colors or what have you, or you can uh, make your own. So you can see here, you can start the generator or you can explore trending palettes of what people are using on the internet already. So again, when you're doing your homework and you're looking at competitors and looking at what's out there, this is a good place to also look. What colors are they using? And again, you don't want to copy everyone's colors. You don't want someone landing on your website and saying, oh, black, yellow, orange, white. Oh, it's like Amazon. No, 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 no. You want to make sure you're unique and you have your own brand. But if you're not sure how to expand your color palette, if you feel like your website is dull, this is a great place to do that. So you can pick colors and they'll all work. Now, as it relates to images, you wanna pick images for your website that are going to sell. Yes, so high quality images, beautiful photography, etc. I've seen this happen many times where people go to the internet, they go to Google image search and they search for an image and they grab it for their website. That's not legal. Those are not free images. They belong to somebody. There are website repositories that do offer free images. Just doing a quick search on Google will show you about 10 different on the homepage alone on the first page of results of free sites that you can just grab their images. There are different licensing rules around some of these. So make sure you read that. Some of them require attribution, meaning you have to post on your website that I borrowed this image from whatever person or site that I got it from. That's fine. Doesn't end user doesn't care. They care about the pretty image. And if you can, obviously, the, the quality of what you get on cell phones these days is crazy. So if you can shoot your own photos, even better. If you know a photographer, even better than that, because they'll do a, a pro job, they'll clean up the photos, et cetera. But if you can't do that and you are going to use stock photos. My ask is that you use something from the same theme or set so it goes together. You don't wanna have disparate images that look like different brands, and different companies, and it should all look the same. So like this background, how it's blurry, if my images on my website are gonna have a blurry background to focus on the product, then stick with that. You don't wanna keep messing around with different images and different uh, sets of images that just don't match. And again, most of these websites are competing to make this as easy as possible for you. So they'll typically have like sister images or families of images that you can just pick from. So do that, use it. So WYSIWYG editors, again, it stands for what you see is what you get. They're easy to use. They have existing template galleries already. There's no hosting required. And by the way, a lot of those templates are tested so they know that they work or they convert or what have you. They have a familiar and easy to use interface. It looks a lot like Word or like Microsoft Paint these days. It's, it's as easy as it gets. And a lot of it's drag and drop. And so some of the more popular WYSIWYG editors are Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, Shopify. Elementor is also, but that's for WordPress. So you have to be comfortable with having a WordPress install done, purchasing Elementor, because it's not, we can use the free version, but to really make it, a website you need the pro version which will cost you money every year just like all these other websites will none of these are free so you can go sign up for a free site through squarespace right now for 14 days or seven days or whatever it might be eventually you have to pay if you're working with a WYSIWYG editor we're having a lovely afternoon down for my glass here if you can't hear it if you're working with elementor for example they have interfaces like the one on the side here so in this case, we're gonna edit the heading that says, do not worry. 
And you can see on the left-hand side, you can change the text color. You can change the typography, meaning the font family, the size, the weight of it. If you want it to be uppercase, lowercase, underlined, et cetera. So you have all these options that this is all code, but they built into an interface that you can just use by dragging and dropping and clicking. They're very easy to use, extraordinarily easy to use. As someone who coded websites back in the 90s, it's almost unfair, but they're very easy to use. Now, as it relates to coding, the internet relies on HTML, stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's a system of code that was developed by the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. It has a hierarchical structure. So like when you write a paper for college or for class, there's a structure that goes to writing a paper. When you create a web page, it also has a structure. And so good code is gonna follow that structure and follow W3C standards. And if you do decide to code, and you break something, you will know because it will show. If it does not load an image, it will show a broken image. If you didn't close off a tag properly, your site will typically break or will display the broken code. So you will know if it's not working really fast. What does that code look like? Well, if you go into your browser and you go to view source by selecting the tabs along the top, Sometimes it's in developer mode, sometimes in the view mode, but there's a, an option to view source. What you're going to see is something that looks like this. And the first line that's in this document or in this index.html, which is the default page that all browsers and websites look for, for your home page, they want you to declare what type of document this is. That is for the browser. So the browser knows when it's about to read this code, what is it looking at? So we've declared, and this is rudimentary, but we've declared our document type is HTML. That's step number one. And there is no way to close that tag off. There's no need to. You're just declaring it's HTML. The second piece that must be there is HTML. So having the brackets with HTML must be there. You just told the browser it's HTML, now write some HTML. The document has a format to it as i mentioned like a paper so there's the head of the document most of what appears in the head is not for users to see most of it some of it does show up in this instance and if you look at it again open up a browser window type in any url along the very top of that browser not the address bar but above that where you would close the browser out is typically where the title tag would appear. This is important also for search. Google looks at this stuff. Users see this stuff when they search for you. So this, my first web page that appears on this example does not show up on your website. It will not be in the actual browser itself for someone to read as they're scrolling through. But in Google's mind and in the top of the browser, it will appear there. And it does matter for search engine optimization purposes. The body of it is the stuff that shows up on the page. So in this instance, we're using what's called an H1 tag. H1 stands for header one. An H1 tag, much like writing a paper for college, is, the to is what the topic of this paper is. So this is about my first web page. And good SEO will match the title with the H1 tag. So as we're looking at creating this document or this content, Thinking through the hierarchy of these pages and how this content's gonna flow matters. Using the right code matters. If you're not using the right code, these things can be run through different tools um, to tell you what, where you missed out or what you did wrong. The P tag is a paragraph tag. So if you're gonna write regular copy, like a paragraph, you would just put it between P tags like this. And the browser knows that, okay, it's now declaring this is a different thing, it's a paragraph, it belongs down here. And the last thing is that good code always ends, always ends. <coughs> Meaning, if you look at line number two of this, it says HTML. Look at line 13 of this, it ends the HTML. It lets the browser know, no must, that's it. That's the end of the document. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of free ways to learn HTML. These are, this is a cheat sheet that I put in here that will be in the presentation that if you are editing code, if you decide to go into the code of your website and you want to add an image, let's say, under the section here marked image tags, 
it has the code for how to put an image in there. And what it says is you must copy this exactly, a caret, IMG, which is short for image, SRC, which is short for source, equals quote URL, end quote, and then another caret. The URL is the location on the internet where that file lives. If you don't put in the full URL and just put in the name of the image, it needs to be sitting on the root directory of your website. Probably not where it's going to sit overall, but as you understand how people get how the browser thinks, it says, I need to pull this image from where. So that's what that URL is. So again, going through you know, HTML is an entire course, so to speak, but changing your own oil, it's good to know how to do it. So I, I would highly recommend doing a basic HTML, uh, you know, class or what have you, because it's worth knowing how to do it. And plus, if you break something, you can always fix it. So your website has its content, it has architecture, you know what colors you're gonna use, and you, you've got everything ready to go. You're looking to code it. And now what you want to do is test your website. So what you're looking for are things like broken links, looking for missing images. As I mentioned, you said, oh, it's this is the file name, but Google says I can't find it. Well, that's a problem. You need to match that up and figure out so it shows up. Uh, looking for typos. That's important too. I just had somebody apply uh, to for a job and their cover letter had typo. Now do the same for your website and the entire world seeing that, right? So make sure you, you proof your stuff. I put in cross device rendering because not everybody's on a phone. A lot of people are these days, but not everybody's on a phone. So you need to understand how does your stuff show up on a tablet or on a browser. And there are websites you can test your stuff out for free to do this. And finally, load time. And not that that's last, it's actually very important. Does it take forever for your website to load? Now, I'm gonna dump out of this for one second. <coughs> Pardon me. What can I do if I have a membership site? Should I three R? Yes, 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 yes. Each of those memberships is different. And your, your goal would be to step them up through a ladder process, um, wherein you know, you're know you taking them from being one type of member to the next to the next. So I mentioned about writing a quick sitemap. This is my sitemap that I created very quickly. And this is for my event website that I'm creating. So you can see, I'm gonna have a homepage, I need to have speakers from my event. I'm gonna have a schedule so people can see what's going on. I want them to buy tickets. I'll have a blog so I can post news and updates and information and new speakers and new sessions as they're added. And then I wanna have my sample content. So as I look at my website, I created this, I created this coming soon page or, or speaker website in Squarespace. That's this little logo here is. And I did it in about two seconds. And what I did was I went to the homepage and I put sign up. I gave them my name and my email. And then it said, what kind of website are you building? And I said events. So I clicked events. And then all the templates changed and said, pick a template. So I did. <coughs> or me. So just by clicking three times, I had a website. Now, I don't need content for the website and I don't know what my event's even gonna be about because I just made it up on the fly. But I was able to create this website on Squarespace, Squarespace within a few seconds. And so as I click through to it, I've got my pages right here. You can see as a WYSIWYG editor, <coughs> but I have my speakers page, my schedules page, my tickets and my blog. And if I wanna edit any of these pages, Let's go to speakers. I can select my speakers. It's a published page on the site. Why is one of the scrolls over here because I can't see it. So I have all this stuff. If I want to edit the page, look up here on the top. Ready? I'm going to edit my page. It's that simple. I click edit and I can start editing stuff. It's just taking a second to load in. So you can see as I hover over each of these sections, it highlights them and lets me type right on it. So you're now speaking at my conference. And it is as simple, like I said, as Word, right? To do this, to edit this stuff. But the goal always is to have a plan going in, 
because they've made it so easy to do this now. Anybody can do it. Literally anyone can make a website these days. So we're at 101 and I got through 41 slides and now I'll be happy to take questions. I saw there was one about membership. And again, the goal is as your ladder, if you have people who join at a certain membership level, you should have content that pushes them to the next one and reasons why they should up upgrade and, and all those things. That was also where things like email marketing, your blog, all those things come into play because you can now talk to them directly to say, did you think about upgrading? These are the benefits you would get, et cetera. I had a, I don't know. can you hear me, Dave? Uh, yeah. Yep. No, great job. Um, I had a, I had a question actually. What, can you speak on in terms of if somebody goes on a mobile, you know, if they're on their phone, they go on a site that's maybe not mobile compatible, or if they're on a, a laptop or whatever, and they go on a site that's maybe cumbersome or just hard to navigate. Is there like a statistic, like how quickly somebody loses attention, like within a minute or something, or even less? So can you speak to that? It's even less these days. In 2021, attention spans are shorter than they've ever been. And so if people don't get what they want immediately, they bail. They just yeah. they don't bother. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's crucial. If you have a website that's not mobile responsive, you have probably have a 99% bounce rate. Wow. Meaning people are showing up and leaving immediately. So awesome. it's, it's, it's very important. We just redid a website for a client that had that, <laughs> they had that happen where they're like, our website traffic's not very good. I'm like, there's a lot of reasons for that, but yes. And once they get here, they leave immediately. So yeah. it was not mobile friendly. And so we, re we redesigned it. So that would be responsive, meaning that it would respond across different devices and, and, and work. Awesome. Um, one, I had another question. Um, in terms of um, images, like if I was taking my own images for my site is is there any is it recommended to to use like a, a, a maybe higher end camera or or phones of good quality to 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 provide those type of photos so can you speak to that i've used phones i've used cell phone the quality of cell phone images today is so good now you can get away with it in a lot of instances um i know people who have used the portrait mode on their phone to do their company headshots and their bios and stuff. Uh, the, the, well, even large media's homepage, if you go to our homepage, uh, the, the uh, waves rolling in, that's Domes Beach that I shot from the lighthouse in Rincon. Uh, so you can get a high quality, high resolution photo or video that you can use yourself. When you, if you are gonna do a photo shoot, plan it out. You wanna make sure you do different angles, different lighting. You may have to do touch up on the photo or what have you. But yeah, you can you can you can do it yourself. I I like hiring photographers if if you know if it's needed and warranted because uh, they're pros and it comes down to time and editing and, and all those things and expertise. But your phone, you can get away with product shots. You can get away with a lot of stuff just using your phone. Awesome. All right. Uh, looks like uh, Rosalind has a question. She asks, um, "How easy is it to migrate my website from, say, a WordPress to Squarespace?" So they typically will have a plugin uh, of some kind that would do that. Um, there are tutorials on how to do it as well. Um, I've actually taken people off of those platforms onto WordPress, so kind of all the way around. Uh, and a lot of times you can just export the content and re-import it uh, you know, into the new site. It's not terribly difficult. It's just a matter of what's your level of comfort with you know, exporting and re-importing and doing things like that. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, I think uh, we're coming up on the hour mark. So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and close it out. But uh, David, thanks again. Uh, great content. As always, I learned a ton. Um, I look forward to, to, to partnering with you again on these. These are always chock full of content. So um, I, we will be sending out this presentation to all the attendees. So they'll, they'll be able to go in there. Uh, you can see here, uh, there's Dave's um, email. So if you have any additional questions for him, or anything like that, feel free to reach out. Again, uh, visit our website, NPR Chamber, to stay up to date on our upcoming webinars. Uh, I know Dave touched on SEO. Um, so we actually have a couple planned for all uh, in August um, that'll touch SEO in English and in Spanish. So again, check out our event calendar, register, subscribe to our newsletter and all that. Um, and then besides that, Dave, did you have any uh, last words before we go ahead and close this out? 
No, I just got a question that's asked, which platform do I recommend? Oh. I think it depends what you're, looking at, what you're looking to do. If you're e-commerce, then Shopify is where I'd go. Uh, if it's not an e-commerce website and you're just a business looking for a brochure web type of website, then Squarespace is fine. Um, if you're looking to do a ton of blogging, I'd recommend WordPress. That's, that's, it's built for blogging. The other platforms have tried to, you know, increase their capabilities, et cetera, but they're still not, they're still behind there. But for the most part, if it's e-commerce, I'd go Shopify. If it's brochureware, you're fine with, you know, either, uh, you know, said Squarespace, Wix, et cetera. Uh, just, you know, watch what you get and what they what the upsell is. That's always the, they may, may have a great website editor, um, but everything you want to do beyond that ends up being upcharge. So it's just doing some homework around what, what are the features that you have to have or want to have. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So um, with that, um, you know, everybody have a, have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. And again, stay tuned for all the upcoming webinars we have uh, moving forward.